like the Red Raider, like Texas Tech. Yep, spelled a lot different, but yes, man, it sounds just like that. But like Texas Tech. Um, so he's from Gillespie County. Yes, ma'am. And he was born and raised there on a commercial sheep, goat, cattle, and swine yes, operation. Everything. Wow. Um, he's very active in both the 4-H and FFA. And oh, this is really long. Do you want to? No, you don't need to read it. I'm going to cover, I'll cover some of it, actually. Okay. So anyway, he's going to talk to us about how to manage your land during a route because we're always actually in a drought. So here he is. <laughs> All right. Thank you, guys. So I am going to talk about managing during a drought, but like the title says, I'm pretty much we're always managing for a drought. Um, even even if you're um, managing for wildlife or if you're managing for production ag. And so I just wanted to give you a little background. I did grow up. I'm, I'm turning 50 this December, so um, been around for a little while, but grew up on a ranch right next to Terra Linda. Um, we've got um, some great neighbors there. And so... Um, um, it, ever since I was a little bitty kid, Terra Linda's always been there. I think it was put in in the 60s, right? Late 60s. So um, they've been great neighbors, but got to see two different sides, production ag. And then um, even though Terra Linda has some production ag, um, also got to see kind of how a subdivision can work. And and um, I tell a lot of people about Terra Linda and how you can model a subdivision. Lovely. We're going to I'm sorry. Okay. On how we can model a how you can model a subdivision and um, have some houses and still try to keep the land in somewhat a natural state. Um, so my ranch there, we do do production ag, sheep, goats, cattle, also run a few exotics, which we love. And you may wonder, Brad, why would you say you love exotics when you come to talk to master, master naturalists? So um, don't throw any rocks just yet. I got a point. But um, we do make about half of our money off of wildlife. We do um, lease our ranch to, um, to whitetail hunters. And um, hopefully over time, we are looking at um, improving the habitat for our doves. Um, as we used to be a, um, more in commercial farming, we had a lot more doves in the county, I think. Um, we are getting more. And so we hope to add some sunflower um, fields and some food plots and maybe even get a little more commercialized in the dove hunting. And then also, um, at some point in time, we will probably venture out a little bit into um, to um, B and Bs or an RV type setup, um, so we can bring people in and they can experience nature or can experience production ag. So maybe a little agritourism, nature tourism type deal. So those are things we're looking there at the ranch. So you may ask Brad, why are you doing all this? You're talking to a grump bunch of master naturalists, um, and one of the reasons why I think it's important that. If I can bring value to my ranch, um, maybe I can keep my kids from selling it to a subdivision. So um, those are some of my points that um, if we can keep some value, keep some money coming in from some of the property, um, maybe that won't be sold and subdivided. And so um, my brother works in Montana. Um, he's a sheep specialist up there. And finally, um, their wild, fish and wildlife department have come to um, work a little bit more with the ranchers and and try to collaborate a little bit more instead of fighting against them for that same reason. Um, if they can keep land and production ag, um, even though their goals may not 100% align, um, they, they align better than, than concrete and brick. So that's kind of my, I just want to give you that. So let's take a survey here just a little bit, find out who I'm talking to. Um, how many have moved to Hill Country in the last 10 years? All right, quite a few. Um, how many um, born and raised here? Two, three. All right. Let's do a little bit on property. How many of y'all have less than five acres? Okay. How many of you have more than 100 acres? I know Kim did because she told me that over the phone, so I knew I could get one. All <laughs> right. So I will say um, some of my presentation is probably a little more geared to um, to maybe a little bigger acreage. Um, but not that we can't take something away from it all. As I was building this, I will have to say, um, I spent a lot of time on this today. Over the last three weeks, my I'm a, I'm a board member for the um, American Dorper Association. I'm the president this year. Um, I gave them a one-year term, so all those that um, here don't are not going to raise their hand to be a board member or to step up for a job, 
just say, I'll give you one year, or I'll give you two years, and then you can politely go away. So I encourage everybody to do that. Um, anyways, um, my executive director um, quit on us suddenly about three weeks ago. So I've had two jobs in one. And plus, I've been trying to set up interviews and hire a new executive director. So I have been 100% slammed at home and at work trying to get all that done. So uh, the slide presentation is, is here. We're going to talk about it, but it may not be 100% in order. And um, I may skip around just a little bit and not have a perfect. Okay, come on. How about we do that? There we go. So one thing I always like to be in, whether I'm doing a production ag talk or whether I'm doing a wildlife talk, um, I always like to show this picture. Um, I, when I was developing this, this slideshow and, and talking, um, I was thinking about a lot of the questions that I have come in to my office from landowners um, about managing their property. And um, this is one slide I always like to begin with because one of my favorite questions I got three or four years ago, every other call was, how, I want to make my soil health better here in Gillespie County. You know, and you want to die laughing, <laughs> but you got to be respectful. Um, you know, we just don't have a lot of soil here, do we? You know, in some areas we may get two or three foot, get down the river bottom, get down in the draw, and you got a little acreage there. But, um, but, and I hope we have more soil than that in some areas, but, but that's not a far cry from what a lot of us see. Also, um, we all know climate change is, is big on, her, on, on what's in the media today and what's going on. And, and I was lucky um, when I grew up, I, I had a lot of great aunts and uncles um, that didn't have kids. And so we got to hang around them. We lived 20 miles from town. So um, they were a lot of the people that we talked to. So my great aunt, great uncle, um, a lot of them were born in 1920s that I spent a lot of time with. So I got to hear about the drought of the 50s. Um, I got to hear about the flood that broke that. Um, I got to hear about um, tons of different environmental events that went on. And so when I look back over this chart, this is a historical rain chart for Gillespie County. And um, realistically, it kind of tells me there is no average, right? We're either going to get flood or we're going to be in a drought. Yep. So um, I, like to, I like to lead with that just a little bit. And I'm not going to sit here and debate that um, climate change isn't happening, but, uh, but it's but we've had big swings in our climate forever and we're going to continue. So we might as well just get ready and get used to it. Um, the next slide right here is our, um, this one's maybe more for production ag when we talk about grazing, but I think it has some benefit here. This is historically when we get the, mo the majority of our rain. If you see, we have a great growing season there in May and June. We also have a great one in September and October. Um, you know, as I'm talking about people about managing their grass for their livestock, um, you know, if we're sitting in the summer and we don't have, for some reason, we don't have a lot of grass, I'm like, well, we can hold out till September, October. Maybe we'll get a good rain. We'll grow a lot of grass. We'll grow a lot of forbs in that time. Um, but we get to right now, um, we get to September, end of September and get into um, mid-October and we haven't got a lot of rain. We're going to, we might be in a bind because we're not going to grow a lot of forage. Um, about November 15th, the, gr the ground gets too cool. We grow just, we might green up, but we're not going to grow a ton of forage. And that's really going to last all the way until Valentine's Day. So um, we can green up and we can we can have a lot of forbs. We can have a lot of winter weeds. We can do really good for our wildlife and for our animals through that winter time. Um, but we're just not going to grow a ton of forage. I like to call the summer kind of our dormant time of the year, realistically. Um, when we get into June and July, and I didn't put a picture on here. I usually do it for my egg producers. Um, go out and take a um, thermometer and hit bare ground, and it'll usually shoot 120, 130. And um, there's just not a lot that's going to grow in that. So when we're not going to germinate any seeds, um, if they do germinate and we don't get an extended period of rain, um, we're not going to, they're going to die. So I like to present this also. We've got some good up and down. So again, not a lot of normal um, here on rainfall. So Here's last one. This actually has maybe got four or five foot there of what we call topsoil and rock mixed in. And then we get down the bedrock, but got a lot of trees there on top of it. So, all right. Um, so managing habitat. I like, these are some of the big things that I like to look for when I talk about managing for habitat. Um, water, um, obviously, um, some of you, if you've got five acres um, and your neighbor doesn't have any water out, we do need some water for this wildlife. 
um, in, the, in the right type of water. If you've got 100 acres, um, maybe you've got water right up next to your house for your dog or something, but we got to think about maybe how to get some of that out in the pasture. Uh, managing for edge. So anybody know what edge is? Surely y'all had a talker talk about edge and wildlife. Um, so I, one of the big things that I like to talk about, not having a monoculture out there for our wildlife, managing for edge protection. Um, we talked a little bit about what protection looks like, whether that's a cedar tree, whether that's tall grass, whether that's an old fallen down tree. Food, right now, probably food um, besides water. Food was probably one of our number one concerns for our white-tailed deer um, for a lot of things, just because we hadn't produced anything. There was no flowers out there. Um, there was very few seeds. So um, food has been a big one. And then cover. Cover kind of goes with protection, but maybe just a little different um, site from cover where they can lay and feel like they're, they're safe and they're not out in the wide open. So some of the things we're going to talk about today, a, a little on some and, and um, a little more on others. So one of the other things I like to talk about, especially with my egg producers, um, I have a lot of them that I think just come to talks to hear us talk and to socialize and enjoy the good food that I've learned that they like. And, um, and they go home and they take everything home and they look at it and they never do anything. So um, I always like to put this in there. Proper management takes work. Guys, a great idea is just a great idea. If you're not going to get out and do it, um, I mean, or if you just want to go home and research everything on YouTube for 10 hours a day, you still just got to get out there and do it. Um, and so um, <clears throat> I'm going to talk a little bit about grazing today. We can cover some on brush control. Um, we all have trouble with um, feral hog ex um, exclusions um, and then creating edge takes some work. One thing I do want to I want to mention the, the hog exclusions right now before I forget. Um, I, it, it is amazing to me, number one or number two call, probably um, number two now that the drought is taking a little more of my phone calls, but everybody wants to get rid of their hogs. One, they want, first of all, they want somebody to come hunt them. Can you come shoot my hog for me? Well, we, if, if y'all had a talk on feral hogs, hunting them, it, it makes you feel good and you're going to get rid of a few, but it's not the end all be all. Um, and so I'm like, well, do you have um, excursions around your deer pens? Well, no. And I'm like, and, and that's why a lot of them want, want to get rid of them. They're, they're coming to their feeders or something and, and disturbing their deer hunting. And I'm like, well, we need to do that's number one. If you're not going to do that, then we don't even need to discuss anymore. Because um, if we're feeding the hogs, one, we're attracting them. One, we're giving them feed that they need to have a higher reproduction rate. And so um, we're just going to produce more and more. Same thing if, if we could say about deer, if, we, if we've um, people who call and want to know about feeding deer. So, so that's one thing I, wanna, I wanted to bring out here. Um, if you're looking for advice, um, don't be scared once you get the advice that you're looking for to go out and, and tackle the advice that you were given. Um, that's what's going to help us get through. So creating edge, y'all all shook your head. Yes, I put a little... Um, um, thanks to NRCS, a little deal down there at the bottom that talks about edge. Um, maybe not perfect for wildlife, but it does give you some idea there of that bottom picture. We go from a grassland to a wooded corridor, maybe then to a creek or some water, um, and we just keep alternating those and, and gives us some great edge that, that wildlife just love. So here's one um, that we have to come, I, I think is probably one of the most important ones in the drought. Um, we are seeing concentrations of feral hogs. We see concentrations of deer. Um, and so we think about the little squirrel. I mean, um, our ranch is about a thousand acres. Um, we've got water. We're, we're trying to develop our water system a little bit better, but we've got 500 acres that doesn't have water in it and everything needs to drink. So just think about the distance that things need to travel to get to water. Um, in a city landscape or more in an urban landscape, you know, I think we all think maybe that the neighbor has water or but but just, you know, maybe take an evaluation with your neighbors or a survey. Hey, who has water out there for the wildlife that's around? Um, one of the neat things y'all probably had a presentation on is the um, becoming very popular and required by NRCS. Whenever we um, get dollars from them to put in a watering system to your left is a little. I um, guess I could use the. Yeah, you know, not getting it to come up. 
I have to press it or not? Oh, wrong thing. There it come up. So um, this is a deal, the last squirrels. No, not coming up on there. Yeah. Oh, I was just if it was there was a pointer. Yeah. No. Oh, no. Oh, it, I thought you said I could use the green arrows to pointer, but it, oh. it doesn't show up up there. No, no. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, but you see the uh, picture to the left. Um, so this is the squirrels, and um, even birds can crawl out um, if they get in there and they get caught and they don't drown. So what do you think about the... Um, the water trough to the right. Think the guy's wasting water? A little bit. A little bit. What do you think? Um, good or bad? Bad. Looks like a good hog wallow. Good hog wallow. So um, what about to um, the birds and all your insects that come up there? Things are going to germinate around there. Weeds are going to grow. Honeybees. Um, probably don't want to waste that much, but um, having, a, having a little dirt, water hole like this can be very, very beneficial to wildlife. Um, one of my friends in West Texas even, um, they run black poly pipe out through their pasture. You can buy it really cheap. One of the things I love to water trees with, I think it's three eighths inch around the size of your, um, your thumb. And they would run it out through their pastures and instead of putting water troughs out there for their deer and stuff, they would run that black poly pipe, punch a hole in it every thousand foot, hundred foot. And um, then when it got dry, they'd turn it on and let it drip. And um, it would make little oasis out there in the middle of those pastures. So we don't have a lot of quail around here, but it was like a quail magnet. Drew a lot of insects in. They had water. They had a little bit of cover there from the from the grass that it grew. And um, so when I look at that, we always want to fix these leaking water troughs. But then in reality, sometimes a, a good um, little bitty mud puddle out in the middle of a pasture would be a perfect habitat that we'd have for wildlife. So just wanted to bring that up to you. So one of the big things I like to always talk about, a lot of people call me and they um, they want to they want to clear every tree, especially the dead ones. They want to mow the grass as short as they can grow. And, um, you know, I have to tell them, guys, you know, I know you want part of it to look like nice. But if you're really you bought this for wildlife, we need to leave some wildlife habitat, mowing it all down with a brush hog and and, and clearing it all is, is going to make a pretty park, but it's not going to be very nice for our, for our wildlife habitat. So, so I have to explain to them, sometimes you just got to learn to love things. Um, when I was a young kid, I was 100% production ag until um, through a lot through college. I did take some wildlife courses, but I'll never forget. Y'all may have had him come talk. Dr. Dale Rollins um, wrote some articles. And one time he wrote an article where he took a picture of a, um, a weed um, patch and said the, you know, if you like, if you love this, you got to learn to look through the eyes of what you're trying to manage. And to a producer like me who's trying to run cattle or was, you know, I hated that picture because I had spent all my time getting rid of weeds. And he said, if you look through it, the eyes of a quail, all that is seed and food and cover and protection. And so, so I try to explain that to the, to the people who come here. So um, just as good as this picture is, let's see. What do we got to learn to hate about this? What isn't good? Anybody? Oak will? I've learned to live with it. <laughs> I think I'm going to give it to every tree so maybe my, my grandkids don't have to watch them die. No. <laughs> but what is there? There's one place. There, there's two places in Texas, um, or in Gillespie County. One that has oak will, one that's going to get it. So um, I hate to say that. I've We've lost some beautiful, beautiful trees. It is devastating. And and now I get to see my neighbors a little more, which I don't like that either. But um, I've also learned, I used to hate cedar and I've learned to love it a little bit more. So um, anyway, so we've got, what's the orange grass down there at the bottom? A little blue stem. Um, probably, you know, this might not be the best picture, but, um, but probably that's last year's growth. Might be two or three year old growth. Um, this is a, this is a tinder box guys. And so, um, this is something that I saw firsthand on my ranch about three years ago. Um, uh, my dad got attacked by bees and, um, my brother and him went back there and burned them out and left at lunch. Everything was calmed down. The wind picked up right after they left and it started a fire, um, burned off about 180 acres. And we have, we have, this is what our place looked like. Um, maybe the grass wasn't quite this tall. Um, but we had a lot of dead live oaks. The other problem we had in that pasture was he had just dosed it. 
Um, and so we had a lot of dead cedar that you'd pile, not made small piles. And so what was happening was this fire would get in that taller grass, would run to a brush pile, burn. The brush pile would light the tops of those um, dead live oaks and the embers would come out 30, 40, well, probably 20, 30 foot in the air. And they would go and land in other tops of live oaks. And so the fire department thought they'd have it shut down and all of a sudden they'd turn around behind them and there'd be a fire behind them. So we told them just go to the back of the property set it on fire and let's just burn it all or we're going to be here for two weeks trying to fight it. Um, over that day, it kind of got to the fence line and then we did a kind of a control burn on one side that was up against um, Silver Wings, if any of y'all know where that was. So we didn't risk. Um, so we had fire trucks there when we burned that. So we didn't risk it starting on fire and getting in there. So, so um, what could we do to manage that? Thoughts? Knock it over, knock the, um, yes, we could knock the tree over. What about the grass? Graze it. All right. Um, we're going to go over some ways to do that. Buffalo historically come through this, this country and um, graze that off, probably more than like a flash graze. So I'm going to talk to you some ideas on how you could maybe do that on your property. Um, one of the things that really got me thinking about this was um, the fire two years ago at um, up around um, Enchanted Rock. Um, if any of y'all saw that property before it burned, it was cedar and grass about twice that tall. Um, once the fire hit that property, there was zero chance of the fire department putting it out. Zero. Um, there was with with a little bit of wind. If the wind would have died or changed direction, maybe. But with the wind that they had and the direction it was going, there was no way um, they could run all the dozers they wanted in there. And, and, and there was no way. It just was way too much fuel for them to put it out. So. This is one of the things when we talk about drought um, that I think may even be bigger in Gillespie County and the Hill Country coming up than our lack of water. As we would get more people doing wildlife exemption and not grazing livestock, fire danger is about to go through the roof in my mind. So um, hopefully, hopefully we don't have a Hawaii. Hopefully we don't have um, something more drastic, but um, I think the potential could be there. So. All right. So overgrazing, is it bad? Yes. Um, this used to be what every property looked like in the hill country. Um, well, minus the 10 cows and the 50 sheep and the 30 goats that were standing there. Um, so it is bad. Um, it, 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 we don't like to overgraze. But what I want to make the point is we can graze grass to this short and it not be overgrazing. Um, probably just looking at this landscape, this is probably a very short grass prairie there. So realistically, if it probably grew three to four inches of grass, you know, there's probably going to be some spots out there where it's going to be knee high. But this, this, with this rock outcrop right here, this, this property right here is not going to produce a ton of forage. Um, and so we can run livestock though across there and graze it to this level. Maybe not quite, but we could graze it for close to this and still have a healthy system. And it's what we call um, flash grazing. And it's going to help reduce our fire um, danger. And that's this is what I want to show you right there. So um, this is a, actually a controlled burn. Um, and um, the, where all the, where all the um, fire is is cedar trees that are burning up. They're full of oils. Um, and at the right temperature, depending on the humidity, um, they can just become tinder boxes. So... Um, actually, a cedar tree can actually stop a fire if the humidity is right. And um, our prescribed burn people use a cedar break to actually stop fire sometimes. But um, when we get in a drought situation, usually that's not the case. Um, we have a lot of tall grass. And um, this is real similar to what happened at the Willow City fire up around Enchanted Rock last year. Um, when when that when that fire, I was standing, sitting on Main Street, and when that fire hit that area that was full of cedar and tall grass, it was like a bomb went off. Um, it was absolutely insane, the amount of um, smoke and the height that that fire got to. So just wanted to share that with you all. Um, this this slide's probably a little out of place because I'm going to go back to a little bit about grazing and how we can maybe manage our fire and manage our fuel load. But um, one of the other number one um, 
questions that people come in my office and ask or I get a call for. What is, I'm, I'm replanting my pasture. What is the best grass I need to plant for deer or for my wildlife? And I'm like, God, I just, I got to cringe a little bit and say, well, you know, grasses aren't typically what deer eat a high percentage. And so, um, you know, if we're just going to go back and plant grass, uh, maybe there's some mixes, other mixes that we need to look at. But I bet I get that question once a month. Um, and maybe they meant mixture of grass and forbs, but typically they want to see grass out there. They don't want to see weeds. And so they ask. So I like to throw this in there. Um, and actually, surprisingly, when I was pulling up this slide, this is off Texas Landowner Association. Um, they say that actually the hill country deer eat more grass than most other deer in other areas. Um, most deer in other areas eat even a smaller percentage grass than what the white, the Texas hill country deer do. So how do I reduce my fire danger? Um, this is one of the things I know all of y'all um, maybe have smaller acreage, but um, talking to this young lady right over here, um, let your neighbor graze your property. Probably you've got somebody touching you that has some livestock. Prefer, if we're going to do a flash graze, we really like cattle. They consume large amounts of forage. Um, they're not as picky as a sheep or a goat. They're not going to damage your trees quite as much, although they can be destructive because they're, they're in curious and they want to see it. Um, but they can come in and we can do what we call a flash graze in a matter of weeks or days or months, depending on the size of your property and the number of animals they have. Um, so if you can find a neighbor who has a fence line common with you, you can just have somebody put a gate in between you. And the reason why I say that's the best, because some people that run livestock, including myself, have eight to five jobs. And when those cattle need to be off this week, they're busy until next week. And so what happens is that gets grazed a week longer or twice as long as it needs to. But when there's a gate between you, that excuse isn't there because you can just go open the gate and shoo them out and run them back on their property. Um, so that is what I love. Um, one, it helps you get along with your neighbor. You're giving them something probably for free. You're getting something out of it. You're reducing your fire danger. Um, you're be surprised your neighbor will be much more likely to fix the fence and not ask you maybe to pay part of it because he's getting the grazing on both sides. And, um, and in some counties and most counties, it'll probably satisfy your ag exemption. We can write that lease where you can have control over, um, how long those cattle graze in your property. Also, those animals are only on your property for a limited amount of time. So we all know if you've ever had cattle, they can be kind of destructive. Um, they're curious. They like to lay around your house. They, um, if you have trees planted, they can demolish them. So, I mean, there, there is going to be some work in doing this. Um, we probably have to put up some exclusions around our trees if we have some newly planted ones. Um, obviously, any type of barn or anything that they can get into. They would rather lay under a shed on a concrete floor than out under a tree for some reason. Don't know why. So, but this is one way you can greatly reduce your fire danger. You don't have to do it every year. You can do it once every two years, but it's it's one way that I would recommend instead of mowing um, that we could come in and reduce our fuel load. And think about it. I mean, if we think about um, um, Texas 200 years ago when buffalo roamed free, exactly the same thing happened. The buffalo come through, grazed all the grass. Um, so the grasses are kind of in tune to this, and this is what how they like to be managed. And so it would make a um, make a good system for everybody. Again, your neighbor gets something, you get something out of it. Um, you can also reduce your fire um, danger by um, producing some edge, um, brush control in certain areas where we don't just have a solid wall of cedar all the way through a pasture might be one scenario. Um, every every property is different. So um, we also, the, the extreme to that is maybe coming in and putting in a, a, a tree exclusion area to fill open property. I've seen producers coming in high fence two or three acres plant different trees in there and let them get mature 10, 15 years. Um, and you're not doing this for you. You're doing it for your kids, just so you know that. <laughs> um, and then lastly, disking. So why do you think disking would be a good um, deal? Turns up the seed bed, exactly. So we're going to get lots of different, what I would consider weed seeds, but lots of different forbs that are going to germinate and come up. Also, going to reduce that amount of standing forage in that certain area. So if you just two or three passes um, and it's 12 foot wide, 
um, we're going to reduce that forage or that amount of fuel that's on that property right there. So it could be a natural fire break if one ever come through. So disc plowing, another word for plowing. Yep. And so we want to, we call it disking here because you want to roll a, um, maybe a, a rototiller might work, but the amount of rocks that we have in this area, we really can't chisel. Rototilling is probably going to break your rototiller. Um, it, and again, every area is different. Um, and so we can't mold board, but um, we can run some disc over it. They roll over the rocks, um, not that they might not break, but that's typically if we want to plow the soil up in this area is probably one of the, the simplest and easiest ways without running a bunch of equipment. So, all right. But um, in disking really, um, we do, when we do that though, we do need to worry about our, our elevation or our angle um, with any of this, um, maybe not the brush control, or the, but with disking, we don't want to do it where we create a uh, erosion problem. So, if we're going down a hill, we might want to dish for a little bit, stop for 10, 15 foot, allow the grass to grow or keep the grass there. And that way, if it does become a turd floater, like some of y'all maybe had last night, um, we get two or three inches, it's not going to wash the topsoil away. If it does, it's going to wash it a little bit. Then we're going to have a, an area there of some grass that's going to catch it. So one thing to, to watch out there. All right, so I, I'm, again, probably talking to the choir here, but this is another um, call that I get quite often during a drought, um, managing wildlife. Um, you are managing a system. So anything that we do um, one way is going to affect that system in another way. So this is a pretty good one. I've got, uh, this is how it usually starts off. I have 20 deer coming outside my house to, that I need to feed. One, what is the best feed? Two, I hear corn's worthless. Um, that's pretty much how the conversation starts. Um, so I ask a few questions. How many um, how many acres you got? Well, I live in uh, maybe Terralinda. I've got five acres, you know, and, and so I say, okay. I said, um, can you hunt them? No, no, and I wouldn't hunt them even if I could. So going, you know, so I try to walk through that scenario and, I, and, and tell, tell them that if we just feed the deer, we're promoting a healthy system. And most of them don't want to hear that. Most people don't. Um, they want to take care of their, literally their pets is what it boils down to. And, and, and I agree. I mean, I've got some pets that I like to take care of, but I do know there is a time when, when we do have to help manage the system. Um, the number two point there, too many mouths can destroy the natural food source is probably something that's happened here in the hill country for years. Um, we've just had way too many deer. We've destroyed a lot of our um, natural forbs, our natural browse, um, either with overgrazing of sheep and goats or with the overpopulation of deer. Um, feeding can make more deer be born and make a bad situation even worse if we continue to feed them. Um, same thing with the feral hogs and a feral hog exclusion. Um, if we can keep the feral hogs from eating the feed. We can keep them from having as big a litters and maybe they won't be as healthy. Um, the last one, and this is one of the best ones, um, and maybe this is my production ag side, um, but I feed them a coffee can morning and night and they still look in terrible shape. So a coffee can is probably about two pounds. So they're feeding four pounds of corn to 20 deer and probably a deer probably of a balanced ration needs about two to three pounds. I'm guessing there, I'm equating that back to a sheep or a goat that's similar body size. But so we would really need to feed them to, to fill all their nutritional needs or, or a big part of it. We probably need to feed them 40 to 50 pounds and probably of a more nutritional feed. Um, something a little higher protein, something that's more balanced. Now, is corn worthless? What do you think? No, it's not. Corn has a ton of carbohydrates in it. Why they say corn's worthless is it's about 9% protein when a deer probably needs about, depending on where they are in their stage of production, between 9 and about 20. So um, it's at the bottom range of that. But corn has a ton of carbohydrates in it and, um, and, and can really help with their energy. It's maybe not going to help a young fawn grow and reach its potential, but it's going to help something that is mature, put on fat reserves and um, help them make it through the winter. So not your best feed, but but it's definitely not not worthless. So so how I you know, one thing I ask them if they can um, 
reduce the number of deer um, hunting. That's what I like to go into. And, and that takes 10 to 15 minutes. Most of them are, don't want to do that or can't do that. Um, but then we also talk about feeding alfalfa, um, has some more protein. Um, they're not just going to devour it all in five seconds. But realistically, even if you're in a subdivision that can't um, harvest these deer, you need to figure out a way to reduce the amount of deer that you're feeding there because, it's, it, again, it's just going to make a bad system worse somehow. You have to have the hard conversations how to get over that. So here is a feral hog exclusion. Um, again, it can also um, keep out young fawns. And so there are some, some brackets, or not brackets, but you can make some smaller holes in there where maybe a fawn can get through. Um, and obviously a piglet could get through that, but a, but a big boar, a big sow couldn't. Um, there's many different ways to do this, whether you're feeding deer um, for hunting or just um, helping them to get along. But um, to me, this is one of the biggest things in managing wildlife. If, if we are going to manage feral hogs, we need to make this. I, I would hate, I don't like mandatory, but um, we need a lot more deer hunters to get this done. So if you have the opportunity to manage any wildlife operations, um, to me, this is a must that, that I think we need to see. One thing about managing feral hogs, um, I get a lot of calls. How do I keep them off my property? So um, first thing is put these up. Um, you'd be surprised. I say they want to keep them off their 100 acres. Do you have these around your deer for years? No, and I'm not going to do it. So I'm like, well, then good luck. Can't hunt them off. You're not going to, I mean, um, large, um, and I don't have a picture of it, but large traps are kind of the best way. Um, helicopters work if you can get landowners, if you have enough large enough lands um, around you to make it beneficial to fly or economical to fly. Helicopters really work. But really on small acreage, I'll be 100% honest, um, fencing is maybe the only way you're going to, not going to say guarantee 100% to keep a feral hog off, but you could probably get to 99. Um, now, we got to make a fence that tight. If you're truly with wildlife, probably not going to allow your smaller deer to get through. Um, deer, older deer can jump it. Um, if you have a lot of, if you have any creek beds or big draws, um, becomes hugely difficult or hugely costly. We can probably get it done, but it's going to be really costly to build something that can survive a small flood and keep a hog out. So um, that's where I, uh, but, but if, if you've got 10 acres, 50 acres, we can spend some money on fence and probably keep the majority of the pigs out most of the time. I think we're getting close to the end here, guys. I'm maybe, um, I wanted to leave some time for questions and um, hope I didn't scare you off. So I didn't get to why a guy would love exotics. I'm, and I did touch on it a little bit, would come to a master naturalist and say that he loved exotics. I was supposed to talk about there with the deer slide. I guess I could go back. All right, right here. So um, we run a few cows. We run a few of high-end Dorper sheep that we sell for pretty good money. And again, um, not bragging, but all of this is designed to, the cows are there to eat the tall forage. Um, the high-end Dorper sheep are there so we don't have to have as many mouths on the property to maybe make the same income. So when I get in a drought, I don't have to abuse my property as much. And hopefully for me and my family can make a little better income. But then we brought in exotics four or five years ago. One of the problems with um, sheep is coyotes. Um, you know, you can be on either side of the fence. Um, there's, there's a group that says, let the coyotes run free. Don't keep them in check. Um, they will help manage the deer herd. I agree. Um, there's the other side that says, um, you know, we need to keep them somewhat in check where they're not overtaking everything. They're not devastating our deer herd. They're not devastating our livestock. So I agree there's two camps out there. So when we got into exotics, we bought a few addicts and a few orcs a couple of years ago. Um, they eat a lot more grass so I can run them with my whitetail. They don't compete the same as the whitetail does, maybe as much as a goat does. Um, sheep eat a lot of forbs as well. Cattle eat mainly grass. And so I could run these exotics and maybe not compete with the wildlife as much. And I don't have to worry about coyotes because they will kill a cow if they come after their calf. So um, they don't have, I guess a mountain lion could probably kill them. 
Um, but I, I can, I don't have to worry about four legged predators at night when I go to bed. I do need to worry about two legged predators um, because they will come and steal them since they're so valuable. So um, anyways, so that is why I would come to a master naturalist group and say, I love exotics. And with the money I make off of them, I can also, again, find value in my property, even though I don't, I mean, even though I have a lot of historical and a lot of family ties to my property, but I can hopefully pass that on to my kids and grandkids. And they can, instead of seeing it worth um, $10 million and going to live in New York, they might want to stay here and ranch. So I'll open it up for questions. Yes, sir. There's a question from the uh, chat room. Okay. Says, uh, what is the best time of the year for flash grazing? Grazing. Well, donkeys do a good job. Um, donkeys could do a good job. Um, uh, and donkeys surprisingly have some value now if you want to sell one. I got a guy who needs one. So if they have some, they could get in touch with me. Um, donkeys are historically have been almost worthless. If, if kind of like um, if you want to be a board member, you know, you got up here and somebody gave you a donkey, you could never get rid of it. <laughs> but actually have some value now um, for a lot of livestock protection. Yes, donkeys could do good. Um, I would say if I'm going to flash graze my place, I want to stay out of the growing seasons. So I, if I could pick the perfect time, it would probably be sometime in the winter um, or whenever my fire danger got high. So like this year, um, the fire danger got kind of high at our house, um, uh, around our, our family's house, uh, probably the same as y'all. What was it? July, maybe first part of July. We got a little bit of rain, May and June. We grew pretty good grass realistically. And, um, we was having some fires pop up and I noticed the, the pasture around my parents' house was probably taught was obviously for a cow guy I was happy. We had some grass, but I said, I'm going to move every piece of livestock in that pasture. And we did that for 30 days and um, greatly reduced the fire danger around our my parents' house. And then we moved them out. So so the summer could be a good time right in the middle of the summer. Also, we can grow a lot of grass in October, which we did last year, September of October. And so I kind of maybe like flash grazing in um, in late winter. Um, October, or November, December, January. A lot of people don't want their cattle, don't want cattle on their place during hunting season. And so, um, you know, you can, if you don't mind cattle on your place during hunting season, we can find a hundred landowners that would bring you cows for that time. If you don't mind that. And cattle don't bother the deer. The deer are used to it. So, yes, ma'am. What's time of year to disc? What would you say? Um, best time of year to disc. So we have seeds germinating all the time. To be honest, I mean, right now, the, the rain that we just got are germinating our musk thistle, our broom weed, you know, the big purple thistles that you hate. They're all coming up, right? They're going to be coming up next two or three weeks. Um, so there's a ton of fall germinating forbs that come up right now. Um, and so like for our food plots, a lot of them we like to, quote unquote, dust in in early August. And then we catch these rains right now and all those seeds germinate and then they can kind of go all winter and all spring, if that makes sense. So I don't think there's probably an opportune time, but I would say if you wanted to hit, because we do have a lot of forbs that germinate there in the fall. Um, so either I would say either first part of September or maybe if, if that wasn't time, maybe in February and we germinate as we start to warm up, we germinate some weed seeds there in March and April. So, yes, ma'am. Two species of exotics that you said you had, oryx and what? And addicts. What are addicts? I'm sorry. Um, okay, sorry for the for the people out there. So, what type two species do I have of exotics? So, I have oryx, which are scimitar horned oryx. Um, they are orange, white with orange mask. Um, they have the horns that just um, sway back. They weigh probably three to five hundred pounds. Um, we can run them on low fence. That's one reason why I have them. And um, that you can almost corn break them. Some of them stay very wild. The other one is the addicts. Looks very similar. It's more gray. Has some white around its um, face. Um, has a, a horn that spirals similar to a kudu, but they're not near the size, not near the horn mass. So do you have hunters that come in to hunt those animals? So you can. Um, we have a lot of our, our land leased to seasoned hunters that have been around for 30 years. Um, so a lot of them, what I do is... Um, 
either I or a vet darts them and we take them to an auction or take them to another ranch um, as a stalker. So we, we don't, we don't hunt them a lot on our place. Um, we dart them and sell them. Yes, ma'am. And, and right now an, an addict's cow is bringing $5,000. And uh, Oryx cows bringing two thousand dollars, and so um, um, again, just telling you this because of um, that that market could crash tomorrow. I mean, I'll be it, it, the exotic market has some highs and lows. Um, there are some species out there right now that are bringing thirty thousand dollars. Yeah. So, um, and and the reason why I chose those two is they're both very hardy. They don't have a lot of disease problems. They, they are well adapted to the hill country. And so, um, and I could afford them. That might be another. <laughs> yes, sir. Okay, this is a question from the chat. Regarding exotics, you mentioned two that are uh, not competitive with whitetails. What others would you recommend and which would you strongly discourage? Hmm. Well, Every exotic system is a little different because those two don't require high fence. And so if I, one, the high fence is very expensive. High fence becomes a whole nother job in managing those animals inside the high fence. Um, if you think just managing your property um, without high fence is hard. You, if you want to manage it right, put a high fence on it and it becomes 10 times harder because you have to really manage the white tail that are trapped in there. Um, and that's what it boils down to. So it, it, if I'm wanting to stay on mine for low fence, there's not a lot of other species I would recommend. Um, black buck are decent, but black buck coyotes love black buck. Black buck are really tough on fences. So um, I don't know if they want to call me at the extension office, we could talk a little bit more about their specifics and, um, and what they would, because there are, just like with any property, there's lots of different situations, but those are the two that I would recommend. Um, the, the other one, I guess, that would fall in that, there's a, an oryx called Arabian oryx. Um, I just, all these species can interbreed, the ones that I'm mentioning, some of them. And so you can only have, you have to have different pastures or different places. And so um, that's a little bit of a limitation why I only have those two. But Arabian oryx would be another one that I would consider for my operation. So in terms yes, ma'am. Um, you know, through the drought for a smaller animal, mm -hmm. um, what would you recommend for that? For smaller, so through the drought for smaller animals, one thing I would make sure um, I would one for birds and things like that. I would make sure my water was was imperative. Um, having a water source that they could get into or drink that they wouldn't um, drown, that they're comfortable coming up to and probably even multiple watering sources where the red-tailed hawk is not going to pick them off, can sit right there and pick them all off, or the owl, or the coyote, or the coon. Um, so having multiple water sources that maybe have some, buy some edge or some cover that they can come up to. You know, and then probably, again, like for birds right now, um, there's not a lot of, there wasn't a lot of ag production for them, like doves, to go to fields. There are some sunflowers, but maybe maybe if I had the supplemental feed just a little bit um, with some different types of grains or something to give those carbohydrates and those proteins, would look because at that. Not a lot of seeds and stuff. Yeah. Happen. Yes, ma'am. So, yes, ma'am. Any exotic that you were referring to? Are you spelling that A D E A X? Is that the animal? A D. Yes, ma'am. Just checking. Okay. Checking. Yes. Yes. <laughs> so they are um, just a little tidbit. They are native to Africa. A lot of those, but some of these species, some of these species are extinct in their homeland, and this is the only place you can really find them. And it's because of the hunting industry that gives them value that that makes them be here. So um, big controversy over over hunting, and um, you know, not to get in that debate today but one of the the pros of hunting is it puts a value on those animals so people want to conserve them and want to produce them and um i know there's multiple other issues but but they are extinct some of those are very extinct in their home prop homelands and and only are produced here so kind of a yes sir again, you 
Okay, so ag exemption. So a lot of um, a lot of I know in Gillespie County for sure they will give you an ag exemption if a producer has a lease on your property, um, a grazing lease, and they know that that producer. Um, so what a, what an ag exemption boils down to is, um, and that may not be. I know I always get in trouble for saying ag exemption, but it's the ag valuation. Um, so that means you're going to have a a um, functioning agriculture enterprise on your property. Well, what gets really hard is on five acres, like Gillespie County requires you to have two cows because to have a functioning agriculture enterprise, you have to have a cow and a bull. And I know that's getting pretty basic, but and so that's what they go off of. Um, but if you lease your property to your neighbor, he can incorporate that into his ag enterprise. And so you can write your lease where you're going to say, we're going to have a number, we can do it by animal units. And an animal unit is a cow and a calf, a pair or a bull. So let's say you've just got 20 acres there. I'm a, I want um, one animal unit on that land or two um, for the year. But you can push all that into 20 days where he could bring 10 or 15 cows over and what we call flash graze it for a week. And then we could move them out. So does that make sense? All the details are in the contract. Yes. 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 And like I said, you do want to be pretty specific um, if you don't know your neighbor, um, because what you don't want to, you want to be very specific and you want to lock them in there. Um, you want to have the water source, give him the right to come on and check them. But um, that way, He's just not leaving the gate open and they're continually coming in for months on months. Um, one, you got to put up with them. And two, they're going to come in and just graze what they want and leave what they don't want. So when we, when we, I, I call it flash grazing, but it's, it's a, it is, it's just a very short period of time. Get them in, get them out. They eat everything and we run them out. So, so would you be responsible for providing them water? To um, so would we be provided, um, water for those animals yes i and i would because one i want them locked on there two um you don't want that farmer or rancher to have to haul water very very unpractical um and so just out of respect and out of convenience for him he may tell you if you can't provide me water i'm not going to do it so to me it would be i'm not going to say a deal breaker but if somebody wasn't going to provide water i would i would think very heavily about not doing it so no money changes hands except for the There can be. I mean, there can be money. Um, but again, I, I tell producers, and it depends on how much acreage you have. Um, realistically, a, a lease um, right here in the Hill Country is 5 to $20 an acre. So, you know, it's so minimal that to me it's it's worth the benefit of retaining my ag exemption and getting along with my neighbor than, um, you know. And he's not going to get a lot out of it. Yeah, he's going to get a week to maybe a month of grazing for his cattle, which can be huge, but it, it, it's we're not talking huge sums of money. So, other questions? All right. Yeah, ma'am. Thank you um, very much for that. I did learn something today. <laughs> So I hope you guys are okay. Um, any other questions for Brad? Otherwise, we're ending the meeting. Huh? Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you, Brad. Hi,